Welcome to the Tanya Acker Show. Welcome to the podcast, and thank you for being here. My next guest is Prince George's County State's Attorney, Aisha Braveboy. Her office runs a number of programs that are geared toward facilitating the reentry into society of people who've been previously incarcerated. Uh, she has, in fact, in her office, hired uh, people who've been previously incarcerated. So we had a conversation about second chances and what's required to get a second chance. Who's entitled to one? As we all know, lots of good people, uh, maybe people, you know, who for one reason or another made a bad choice. Maybe they would do great with the second chance and never had a chance for one. And there are a lot of people who do abuse the second chances that they do get. So uh, the state's attorney and I talked about what's required. Uh, what's required to get a second chance? What role does accountability play in all of that? And how her office uh, does its work. So I hope you find it interesting. I, I certainly enjoy talking to her. Uh, side note, she also went to Howard University Law School. So I didn't go to the law school, but I always have to give a shout out to Howard. Here I am with Prince George's County State's Attorney, Aisha Braveboy. Welcome to the podcast, Prince George's County State's Attorney, Aisha Braveboy. Thank you so much for being here. I'm, I'm really honored that you took the time to spend with me. Thank you so much, Tanya. I'm excited to be here. So Aisha, let's talk a little bit about what is required in order to get a second chance. Your office runs a number of programs that helps transition previously incarcerated people back into society. You yourself have hired previously incarcerated people to work for you. So let's just first talk very broadly. There's a lot of talk about second chances. Some people mm -hmm. don't use their second chances wisely. What's required in your view to get one? I think the best thing about second chances is it's really up to the person seeking the second chance to show and prove that they deserve one. And they can do one in so many different ways. Um, if they are incarcerated, meaning they're being held either in a local jail or in prison, uh, they can really show that they have uh, the ability to reenter our community um, by behaving while they're in incarcerated. So if they are incarcerated and they're acting up, if they're getting into further trouble, then those individuals are not going to be looked upon as individuals that we are going to consider uh, for early releases. But we do look at individuals who have exemplary institutional records, those who may have gotten into a few, had a few problems while they're in, but nothing too serious, as well as those who have availed themselves of educational opportunities as well as job opportunities while they have been in. Uh, many of our uh, individuals who have gotten second chances are people who have served as mentors to others who are incarcerated, helping them, unfortunately, transition into um, confinement, which can be very, very difficult. And so uh, we find that there are, there are leaders, even amongst those who are offenders, there are leaders and people who have, uh, you know, served their time in a way that is exemplary, uh, that we can uh, look to as, as individuals that we'd like to return back to our communities sooner than their original sentence would have allowed. Explain a little bit about what you do in order to help people get ready to come back into society. I mean, a, a lot of the complaints about the system of incarceration right now is that it's so punitive that all it does is teach inmates to be more punitive when, if and when they're ultimately released. So what are the skills? What are you doing in order to get people ready to become healthy, functioning uh, members of society? I'm so happy that you asked that question. I initiated last year a pilot program called the Emerging Adult Program, and this program is for individuals who uh, were ages 18 through 26 when they committed their offense. Those individuals uh, have the ability to, um, I think, change 
uh, more dramatically than, let's say, an older inmate, someone who was uh, charged and convicted in their 30s or 40s. Because when you're young, your brain is still developing, you're still developing those critical thinking skills. And so we are focusing on this uh, group of individuals to help them while they're serving their time and when they transition out. So we have an emerging adult program that provides sort of life skills training. We provide them with mentors. We also provide them with uh, individuals who are in careers that they may want to pursue. We we provide them with guest speakers in those areas so that they know what they have to look forward to and someone who can help guide them uh, when they uh, are released from confinement. But most importantly, uh, we have weekly sessions uh, where they can do a lot of introspective kind of work, work that they need to do on themselves. Because what everyone has to understand is that they have choices. Life deals everyone um, a hand, and sometimes that hand is a good hand, and sometimes that hand is not so great. But even when you're dealt a hand that isn't the best hand, you still have choices in life. And so we, uh, through this program, are empowering people to make better choices and not just saying, just do it. What we're saying is that we're willing to assist. We're willing to help you. We're willing to work with you and guide you and give you a mentor and figure out how to help you develop a life plan so that when you do return, you can be successful. One of the previously incarcerated people you hired is the wife of a former county executive who served, I think, what was it, nine months of a sentence. She got out early for good behavior. She pled guilty, I think, to some federal fraud charges. But she was a mentor when she was incarcerated, uh, was she not? And I think that that's what led to her working for you when she came out. Do I have that story right? She not only was a mentor to those uh, who were also incarcerated with her while she was serving, but when she got out, uh, she worked with the AME Church to develop a program uh, to provide uh, communication with those who are incarcerated who don't get regular communications. A lot of people, when they are serving time, they're serving it alone, and that can be very uh, difficult for people. And uh, to receive letters from individuals, even if you don't know them, saying, hey, we're cheering you on, you know, we look forward to you coming back into our our, our communities. We're here to help you as you transition. Uh, getting those those letters and that level of encouragement is so important for people who are facing some of the darkest days of their lives. So she not only served as a mentor, but then also uh, supported people while they were serving time. Yeah, you know, Aisha, it is I think easy to sort of talk about some of these issues in the abstract, I think intellectually, a lot Mm -hmm. of people support the idea that, you know, you got to give people a second chance. You especially have to create pathways for people to become healthy, contributing members of society, you know, if they've been locked up at 15, 16, 17. And then I think if you add to all of that, Um, a lot of the data that points out that young children of color are far more likely to be incarcerated uh, than are their white counterparts for the same offenses. You know, it makes sense to do some of these things. But let's think about the moment we're in now where there's such a heightened focus on crime, where people, a lot of people don't feel safe. You know, in order to get behind what you're doing, It strikes me that one thing you have to do is to be able to contemplate some degree of forgiveness in your head. I'm not saying you personally, but I just mean we as a society, because a lot of folks are kind of thinking, you know what, you were dealt a bad hand and so was I. But with your bad Mm -hmm. hand, you went and took something from somebody that didn't belong to you, whereas I worked five jobs. How do you get people ready to forgive, I guess is what I'm asking you. You know, I I think that, you know, in talking with people in my community, they want accountability. They want accountability. And but they want it. They want accountability in a way that is fair. So once we have punished someone for doing something wrong, once they have served uh, time, uh, they've been taken away from their families, the society. We understand that at some point they're going to return. So most people who get arrested and charged and convicted 
and sentenced to a term of imprisonment. Nine times out of 10, they're coming home at some point. So the question for our community is, how are they coming back to us? And so what I know that my community wants is that they want people to come back smarter, stronger, better, um, better able to cope with life and the challenges of life and ready to be contributing members of our community. So I think that the way we talk about it is talk about accountability, talk about individuals being appropriately punished, but then also talk about restoration because that is what's going to cut down on recidivism. And that is a strong tool uh, to reduce crime in our communities if we are able to restore people if we are able to provide them with some hope um, and opportunity, then when they do get out, when they do come back to us, they're less likely to reoffend. And again, I, I think it's important that we not lose sight of what you said at the outset of our conversation about who's eligible for these sorts of programs. So for instance, you know, I live in Los Angeles and in LA and San Francisco and other places, uh, people have been talking a lot about, you know, these smash and grabs. You know, people will just go in, take some stuff, they get arrested, they get let right back out. And no one should give short shrift to that sense of impunity. I mean, I think it's outrageous uh, that there has been a sense by some folks that they can kind of do whatever they want because they know the consequences won't be that tough. There is that population of folks out there. Explain to folks who are thinking, you know what? Why is somebody who just threw a rock uh, in my business and ran off with a bunch of stuff and they just got arrested and now they're not going to be, you know, kept behind bars? Explain to folks, Aisha, how and whether or not that category of people um, would be treated in some of these programs that you've, con you know, that you've put together, some of the second chance programs. You know, do, do those folks, would they qualify? You know, would a smash and grabber be able to uh, come and you know, get a job and say, oh, I'm real sorry, you know, let me have a second chance? Where do they fit in, the, in, in, this, in all of this? Well, I think the first step is accountability. It's absolutely accountability. People have to either be held accountable or uh, accept accountability uh, for their actions. And that does mean, uh, in many instances, that they're going to spend a part of their time here incarcerated. And that's, that's the reality of it. Or they are going to be on um, Probation. They may be on an ankle monitor, depending on the type of charge uh, that they're facing. So not everyone who gets charged with a crime goes to jail. That, that never has happened. And so that continues to, be, to remain um, the, the policy. However, accountability is important and some form of punishment is important. I think people want to know that someone has suffered some consequences when, when they have offended someone else. And I think that is perfectly appropriate. But then what? See, that's the problem that we've had in our communities. Because we didn't care enough about the person after they were held accountable or took accountability or after they were punished, now what? We have to care about these individuals. They are coming back to us. And we have to care about how they come back to us. And that's really what these programs are about. It's not to say that people won't be punished or be held accountable. What it means is that we are going to work to make sure that they don't reoffend. And that has to be a part of the strategy. That has to be a part of cr the crime fighting strategy because what we know is that recidiv recidivism, excuse me, is high. Why is it high? Because the circumstances haven't changed for those individuals. So yes, they have been held accountable. They've been they've spent a period of incarceration, but their life circumstances haven't changed. They haven't gotten an education. They don't have job prospects. And I'm not saying that that is an excuse because we we don't uh, accept excuses for criminal behavior. However, these are the factors that lead to people making criminal choices. And as a result, we have to, as law enforcement, look at ways to reduce the likelihood that these individuals will re-engage in bad or negative or criminal behavior. How are you getting people ready? 
You know, how does someone who's been incarcerated from the time they were a juvenile, now they're getting ready to come back out. What are the specific things that you're doing to get them ready? Because it strikes me that there are all, there are all kinds of things that if you come from a fairly functional yes. family or household that you learn, you learn that you need to come, go to work on time. Um, you learn that you need to, uh, you know, pay your bills. You learn, you know, there are just some basic things. And if you don't grow up with that sort of foundation, you know, and everything's kind of like you just got to try to make it any way you can make it, then your values certainly will shift. So what do folks get tangibly? They get out, someone yes. gets out of jail, they have access to a program. What are they going to learn that they didn't learn before? What opportunity will they have access to that they didn't have before? Well, let me just say this. We're starting while they're in, because even if they're not incarcerated here in Prince George's County, where I live, they are Prince Georgians. So they're coming back here. So the program that we set up last year as a pilot, this year as a full-blown program, is a program that allows us to communicate with individuals while they're in prison. We provide them with a life skills training uh, 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 program uh, where they have weekly sessions with uh, individuals who have uh, been incarcerated before, individuals who are experts at um, motivation, um, motivational uh, speaking, as well as uh, technical skills to help train people to enter the workforce and be prepared uh, for life. So we have weekly sessions with, uh, with our nonprofit partners, as well as individuals who want to be a part of the solution. And a lot of these individuals are business owners, business owners who are willing to hire people who have records as long as they are willing to be trained and stay away from negativity. So we are actually connecting them with tangible real opportunities uh, with people who can actually make those opportunities happen for them. We have a great relationship with a number of labor unions here in the D.C. region and in Prince George's County who are willing to train individuals in specific skills uh, that will allow them to be employable. And with the unions, um, what a lot of people know is that the unions really don't ask a lot about your criminal history. They just want to know, do you want to learn this skill? Are you willing to show up? Are you willing to be an apprentice? apprentice if that's what it requires? And do you want to pursue this as a career? If so, we'll take you. And it is those real opportunities that we have been able to grow and then provide to those individuals who are coming through our programs that I think will make the difference. How well is it working? Tell us about some of the folks who came through some of these programs and are doing really well. I, I think it's important that people yeah. get a sense of, you know, is it working? Is this sort of rehabilitation, yeah. is this sort of, uh, are, are these sorts of opportunities making a tangible difference? Yeah, so as I mentioned, the, the, our first year was last year and we had a pilot program. So some of those individuals are still incarcerated but will be released shortly and some of them are out. So the one thing I can say is that those who have been released, uh, none of them have reoffended. Um, they are also in contact with their mentor, the individual who is assisting them to readjust back to life as as we know it, as, as we all enjoy being a, a free person. And so uh, they are employed. Uh, they are attending regular uh, workshops and work groups with others who are in their similar situations so that uh, they can talk about the stresses of life, so that they can find positive ways of, uh, you know, engaging with the community, even when they're, when life deals them a, a blow or a bad hand. What I can say is that I'm proud uh, of all of those individuals who have participated in our Emerging Adult Program, as well as another program that we have called the Back on Track Program. The Back on Track Program was first started by Madam Vice President Kamala Harris when she was the DA in San Francisco. This program um, gives first-time felony drug offenders the ability 
uh, to get a second chance. And uh, those individuals are not incarcerated, but they are put into an intensive 18-month program that upon completion, their record is wiped clean as well as, uh, you know, they, they get an education. So we have um, money to send them to community college. Uh, they can pursue a trade. They can pursue uh, any certificate or degree that they want to. And so those individuals, I can say, have not reoffended. Those individuals who have su- successfully completed these programs, they're not reoffending. So what we do know is that if we spend time with someone, if we treat them like a human being, even if they've done something wrong, uh, if we believe in them, if we give them a sense of hope, uh, they will rise to the occasion. These are people who other people wanted to throw away, but we said, no, we, we can't throw, we can't afford to throw people away. Let's see what we can do. Let's see what they'll do with the second chance. And they've stepped up. And so I'm, I'm very proud of the work that we've done in this area. I think it's so interesting what you said a few moments ago, when you referred to this population of folks who um, are incarcerated and coming out, you said, you know what? They're Prince Georgians. And I think that for um, a lot of folks, and I'm not being self-righteous or even excluding myself from this, I think that sometimes there's a tendency to look at people who've done something wrong or really, really, really wrong. You know, I don't know how many (laughs) adjectives you want to put on that um, and see them as different from us, right? When a lot of those folks... They come from our families. They are. They come from the families of our friends, and they're going to come home. You know, as much as people like to hashtag lock them up and keep them up, that just doesn't happen. Like that's not a realistic solution. And thank you for reminding folks that even before this moment, when people have been focused on reform issues, we never locked everybody up. We never arrested all offenders. We never threw the book at everybody. Um, the law has always uh, had some selectivity. Uh, around those issues. Was it politically risky for you, Aisha, to go down this course, you know, in this moment in which we're living? You know, was it risky or do you have a lot of support amongst your constituents? I have a lot of support amongst my constituents, but to be honest with you, um, I think it's risky not to go down this course. I think what we have seen um, in the the punitive uh, criminal justice system that we have come to know, unfortunately, has really not made us any safer. And so if I were to have gone down the path of, let's say, some of my predecessors or others who are out there who've taken the view that if you've done anything wrong, then you shouldn't be with us in society. You're, some, you're, not, you're not human. Um, if I took that um, philosophy and that belief, and those were my values, uh, then I wouldn't be able to successfully help people reintegrate back into our communities and not reoffend and not reoffend. So I think that um, my community wants accountability. They're going to get accountability. My people want uh, individuals to be punished when they've done something wrong. They get punished when they've done something wrong. But they also want people to have that second chance. They do care about people because, like you said, it's not like we don't know these individuals. They are the people who live in our communities, who may be in our families, who we've gone to school with or children of people we've gone to school with. These are not abstract people. These are real tangible people. And so um, when you've come from a community like I have, I'm from here, you have a different sense of responsibility uh, to everyone. And so I think that my community understands that and they appreciate that. And I have not had any issues um, because I'm very upfront. I I let people know what I'm doing uh, so that if they have questions, they can ask me. But you know what I've learned? is that when I start talking about what we're doing, people are like, how can I help? Can I be a part of that? What can I do? I'll take someone on as a mentee. So they're stepping up and it's it's just wonderful. I'm grateful to be the state's attorney here in Prince George's County. Let's talk a little bit, Aisha, about why you took the path that you did. Why did you decide to go into public service? This is a time when people generally don't regard public service very highly. People of all stripes tend to be distrustful of government and government decision makers. 
You have an incredible background. You went to the one and only Howard University. Hate you. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so with all of that, you know, why this? You're in the firing line. I've seen headlines, <laughs> uh, you know, we don't need to go into them all here, but headlines that, you know, I think maybe have misrepresented uh, some of these uh, second chance programs that kind of, you know, might give the impression that you're just hiring violent people willy nilly. And uh, I think that's a bit disingenuous. I think that you have put yourself, you know, in a position where, you know, you can do some good and it sounds like you are, but it's a tough, tough it path. Is. Uh, why, why did you make, why did you make the choices that you did for your life? You know, it's my faith. Um, uh, I asked God and I am a, a woman of faith and I asked God to let me know what my path is. I said, I, I won't be afraid. I won't be afraid. Whatever path I'm supposed to be on, I'm going to, to, to do my job and I'm going to do it in a way that honors uh, my faith. And um, when I really sat down with myself and listened to that, <laughs> that still small voice inside, it said, you know what? Your passion is to help others. Your passion is justice. Like pursue that. Pursue that as, 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 your, as your career and you will be able to move mountains. That, that is what I truly believe. And so that's why I pursued a public service. That's why I remain in public service. And I can tell you that I have never had a day where, yes, it's been stressful that I've ever said, I can't believe I'm still doing this or, or I don't need this uh, because um, I understand that this job was going to be hard. <laughs> being the top law enforcement officer, being, uh, you know, someone who has to make judgments about people's lives, their character, whether or not to give them a second chance, whether to pursue the more, most serious charges or give them a break. All of that, you know, really requires a lot of intention. You have to intentionally want to do what is just. And that is tough. And that is why... Not everyone can do this job, but I felt I feel very strongly that I am built for this job because I'm built by faith. And so when you have a, a, a strong sense of purpose, you can withstand criticism, scrutiny uh, or anything else that's thrown your way. And when I look at the great work that I've been able to do, the lives that have been changed, not just those who've gotten second chances, but those who've gotten justice. You know, I think about um, the very first big case that my office had, which is a, a, a case against a white supremacist who killed a Bowie State student. Uh, this the, the student who was the defendant was a, a University of Maryland student, which happens to be my undergrad al alma mater. And I actually teach right now at Bowie State. And so this case was, it was a tough case because it was a first-degree murder case. And as you know, first-degree murder is really difficult to prove. And under the set of circumstances we had, it was going to be difficult. But I met with the parents of the victim. And I said, trust me, trust me. And they did not have a lot of trust for the justice system because prior to me, they didn't feel like they had been treated uh, fairly by this office, which is just tough. And so I'm coming into an office. I'm pursuing this big case. I've got parents who are distrustful of the system. And I said, but I, I want you to trust me. And I walked with them through the entire case, held the mother's hand, cried with them, just embraced them. And I still keep on my desk a picture of their handsome son who lost his life. And we were able to get justice. We got a first degree murder conviction for uh, Lieutenant Richard Collins III and his uh, family. But I can tell you that I don't believe that the case would have um, had turned out the way that it did if not you know, for me being in this position, because I made very critical decisions about who was prosecuting the, the case, the strategy that we would take um, in, in pursuing justice. And it all worked out. And in fact, not only did it work out, 
but we were able to get a law passed in the name of Lieutenant Richard Collins III here in the state of Maryland, the hate crime law. And so my, my, my point is that I recognize that I am, I am just a vessel, that the work that I am doing is in furtherance of a higher power and a higher mission. And it's my job to do my job unafraid, unafraid. And that's, that's why I'm doing what I do. That story that you just told is really powerful because it's another reminder that a big part of justice and fairness um, and a part that I think is sometimes given short shrift by people who care about uh, reform is what happens to victims and victims' perspectives and uh, hearing a victim and healing a victim. When you are, and as your office contemplates charging decisions, as your office decides who gets the second chance or who has to stay incarcerated, what role, like how do you consider the victim? What role does victim impact play in your analysis? It's, it's plays a huge uh, role because we have something in Maryland called the, the Victim's Bill of Rights, which means that victims or next of kin have the right uh, to know what is happening in the case uh, and with the defendant involved in their case. So even if we're looking at giving, uh, reconsidering, let's say, a sentence of someone, we have to inform the victim's family. We do take into consideration their perspective. Sometimes we agree. Sometimes we don't. Uh, sometimes they really don't care anymore, you know, sometimes because it's happened so long ago. And let's say it was a robbery or something like that where they're like, I- I'm good. I-, I don't really care what happens to the person. Um, but sometimes, you know, they-, they have really strong feelings and they say, you know what, I don't agree with this this the position of the state. I want to participate in any hearing that occurs that will deal with this uh, resentencing. So we always give the victim uh, the ability to participate in any hearing uh, held um, for that defendant. But we also consider, uh, before making our decision, we we will consider their position as well. And again, sometimes we agree and sometimes we don't, but our goal is to pursue justice in every case. Has it been your experience that there are some victims who, you know, so I, I you know, heard about people who go one step further than I don't care, but it's almost as if, you know, there are some victims who, if the offender will take some responsibility and really own the offense. I yeah. have seen, you know, read about people who actually, victims, who actually don't think that throwing the book is the right way yes. to do justice uh, to their, you know, to the harm or the offense yes. that they endured. You know, a lot, I mean, has that also been your experience? Oh, in absolutely. Your and I can tell you, we had a, we had a case recently where the um, victim and the offender were known to each other, so they they knew each other. And there was an argument, as young men sometimes do, over a female, and uh, which led to a violent act committed by one of the uh one of the individuals, the victim and the mother of the victim wanted the defendant to take responsibility. They wanted him to be held accountable and to have punishment, but they did not want it to impact the rest of his life. And so we did take that into consideration when we fashioned a plea for that individual. And so, um, you know, and that individual ended up in our emerging adult program and has, um, you know, been out um, and has not gotten into any any further trouble and is now pursuing an education. So you're absolutely right. I think that victims have different perspectives and sometimes it's about what happened. It's, it's about the type of offense that occurred. So a homicide, you know, the next of kin, of kin of a homicide victim may feel differently than someone who was, you know, charged with, you know, like auto theft or something like that. So it, 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 it's very different, I think, based on the nature of the charges, how much time has elapsed. That That's also something that, you know, is a factor. But again, the, the point is that the Victim's perspective 
is considered and must be considered when making these decisions. Aisha Brave Boy, state's attorney for Prince George's County, I really hope that you will come back. I would love to continue the conversation with you about uh, how this pilot program and these different transitional programs uh, are working. I think that if we are going to function as a fair and free society, uh, we've got to make sure that we're providing opportunities for people who want to make good choices. Frankly, everybody's not going to want to, but there are a bunch of folks who want to. So uh, kudos to you for being creative and frankly, uh, taking a risk and putting yourself in the firing line in the course of doing so. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. And really, I do hope you come back. Thank you. I look forward to it. Have a wonderful day. 